Preface and Introductory to Wayside and Woodland Trees, A Pocket Guide to the British Silva. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Wayside and Woodland Trees, A Pocket Guide to the British Silva by Edward Stepp. Preface the purpose of this volume is not the addition of one more to the numerous treatises upon silviculture or forestry, but to afford a straightforward means for the identification of our native trees and larger shrubs for the convenience of the rural rambler and nature lover. The list of British arborescent plants is a somewhat meagre one, but all that could be done in a pocket volume by way of supplementing it has been done by adding some account of those exotics that have long been naturalized in our woods, and a few of more recent introduction that have already become conspicuous ornaments in many public and private parks. In this edition, 48 extra plates have been added, of which 24 are in colors. The latter are, in part, reproductions of watercolor studies of flowers and fruits, and partly from photographs by a new method. For the black and white plates, the photographs, it should be explained, have been taken upon a novel plan in most cases. This consists in photographing a deciduous tree in its summer glory, and returning to the same spot in winter and photographing the same individual, so that a striking comparison may be made between the summer and winter aspects of the principal species. Supplementary photographs are given, in many cases, of the bowl, which exhibit the character of the bark, and should prove a valuable aid in the identification of species. Others show in larger detail the flowers or fruit and the characteristic leaf buds in spring. The figures in the text have all been expressly drawn for the work, with a view to showing at a glance the general character of the foliage, and in most cases the flower and fruit. The work is divided into two sections. Part 1, including those species that are generally considered to be indigenous to the British Islands, with briefer notices of the introduced species that are closely related to them. Part 2, being devoted to those of foreign origin, some of them introduced so long ago that they are commonly regarded as native by those who are not botanists. Introductory There are two points of view from which to regard trees, the mercantile and the aesthetic. The former is well exemplified in Dumbadike's advice to Jock. Jock, when ye hae naething else to do, ye may be a stickin' in a tree. It will be growin', Jock, when you're sleepin'. The canny Scot was thinking of the unearned increment another generation might gather in, due to the almost unceasing activity of the vegetable cells in the manufacture of timber. The other view was expressed by the autocrat of the breakfast table, in a letter to a friend, Whenever we plant a tree, we are doing what we can to make our planet a more wholesome and happier dwelling place for those who come after us, if not for ourselves. But, after all, it is the trees that have been planted by nature that give the greatest pleasure apart from commercial considerations. The lonely pine, that grows in rugged grandeur on the edge of the escarpment where its seed was planted in the crevice by the wind. The oak that grows outside the forest where a squirrel or jay dropped the acorn, and where the young tree had room all its life to throw out its arms as it would the little cluster of birches that springs from the ferns and moss of the hillside all trees so grown develop an individuality that is not apparent in their fellows of the timber forest and however we may delight in the peace and quiet of the forest with its softened light and cool fragrant air we can there only regard the tree in a mass we might indeed reverse the old saying and declare that we cannot see the trees on account of the wood. Nature and the timber producer have different aims and pursue different methods in making of forests, though the latter is not above taking a hint from the former occasionally. Nature mixes her seeds and sows them broadcast over the land she intends to turn into forest, that the more vigorous kinds may act as nurses, sheltering and protecting the less robust. Then comes the struggle for existence with its final ending in the survival of the fittest. In the meantime, the mixed forest has given shelter to an enormous population of smaller fry, plants, mammals, birds, and insects, and has been a delightful recreation ground for man. The timber producer aims at so controlling the struggle for existence that the survival of the fit is maintained from start to finish. 
he plants his young trees in regular order putting in nurses at intervals and along the borders intending to cut them down when his purpose has been served the timber trees are allowed no elbow room the putting forth of lateral branches is discouraged but steady upward growth and the production of canopy is abetted his aim is to get these timber sticks as near alike as possible free from individuality and with the minimum of difference in girth at top and bottom of each pole this means a thicker and longer bulk of clean timber when the tree is felled and squared the continuous canopy induces growth in the upward direction only and discourages the weed and undergrowth that add to the charm of the forest but which unprofitably use up the wood producing elements in the soil this plan contrasts strongly with the views on planting formerly prevalent in this country john evelyn for example making a special point of giving the oak room to stretch out its arms free from all encumbrances but then unlike the timber producers evelyn had an eye for landscape beauty and giving an opportunity for the display of such beauty he says and if thus his majesty's forests and chases were stored viz with this spreading tree at handsome intervals by which grazing might be improved for the feeding of deer and cattle under them for such was the old saltus being only visited with the gleams of the sun and adorned with the distant landscapes appearing through the glades and frequent valleys nothing could be more ravishing the greater the success of the forester the more profound is the solemn stillness of the forest and the more monotonous in place of the natural forest with its varied and teeming life we have what wordsworth called a timber factory in the natural forest with its mixture of many kinds of trees the undergrowth of shrubs and carpet of grass and weeds the stronger trees spread out their arms in all directions and fritter away as the scientific forester would say their wood producing powers in making much firewood and little valuable timber but the result is very beautiful and the nature lover can wander among it without tiring and can study without exhausting its treasures emerson says in the woods is perpetual youth within these plantations of god a decorum and sanctity reign a perennial festival is dressed and the guest sees not how he should tire of them in a thousand years to the scientific forester this is all wasteland and he pleads for the higher culture being applied to it with every desire that the natural resources of our country should be properly developed we do hope that he will not be entirely successful in his efforts and that a few of the woods and wastes of nature's own planting may be left for the recreation of the simple folk who have not yet taken to appraising the value of everything by the price it will fetch in the market the trees described in this volume are the really wild growths that have lived a natural life and though many of the photographs are from planted trees they are such as have been allowed to grow as they would and show the characteristic branching of the species a few words on the life of a tree may be welcomed here by those readers who have not made a study of botany although the nurseryman makes use of suckers and cuttings for the quicker multiplication of certain species every tree in its natural habitat produces seeds and is reproduced by them the flowering of our forest trees is a phenomenon that does not as a rule attract attention but their fruiting or seed bearing becomes patent to all who visit the woods in autumn a tree has lived many years before it is capable of producing seed the seed bearing age is different in each species thus the oak begins to bear when it is between sixty and seventy years old the ash between forty and fifty the birch and sweet chestnut at twenty-five years some produce seed every year after that period is reached others every second third or fifth year others again bear fitfully except at intervals of from six to nine years when they produce an enormous crop most tree seeds germinate in the spring following their maturity but they are not all distributed when ripe the birch the elm and the aspen for examples retain their seeds until spring and these germinate soon after they have been dispersed the seeds contain sufficient nutriment to feed the seedling whilst it is developing its roots and first real leaves we can of course go further back in stating our observations of the life progress of the monarch of the forest we can dissect the insignificant greenish flower of the oak when the future seed acorn is but a single cell a tiny bag filled with protoplasm 
from that early stage to the period when the tree is first ripe for conversion into timber we span a century and a half equal to two good human lives and the oak is but at the point where a man attains his majority the oak is built up after the fashion by which man attains to his full stature it is a process of multiplication of weak minute cells which become specialized for distinct offices in the economy of the vegetable community we call a tree some go to renew and enlarge the roots others to the perfecting of that system of vessels through which the crude fluids from the roots are carried up to the topmost leaf whence after undergoing chemical transformation in the leaf laboratory it is circulated to all parts of the organism to make possible the production of more cells each of these has a special task and it becomes invested with cork or wood to enable it to become part of the bark or the timber or it remains soft and develops the green coloring matter which enables it when exposed to sunlight to manufacture starch from carbon and water this is very similar to what takes place in a human organism where the nutriment taken in is used up in the production of new cells which are differentiated into muscle cells bone cells epidermal cells and so forth building up or renewing muscles or nerves bones or arteries but the mechanism of distribution is different the heart pump doing the work of capillary attraction and gravitation the ancients believed in the dryads spirits that were imprisoned in trees and whose life was coterminous with that of the tree and it will be seen that they had stronger physical justification for their belief than they knew shakespeare relates how sycorax the witch mother of caliban imprisoned ariel in a tree and huxley finally tells us that the plant is an animal confined in a wooden case and nature like sycorax holds thousands of delicate aerials imprisoned in every oak she is jealous of letting us know this and among the higher and more conspicuous forms of plants reveals it only by such obscure manifestations as the shrinking of the sensitive plant the sudden clasp of the dione or still more slightly by the phenomena of the cyclosis the tree as we have indicated gets its food from the air and the soil the rootlets have the power of dissolving the mineral salts in the soil in which they ramify some authorities believing that they are materially helpful in this respect so far as organic matter is concerned by a fungus that invests them with a mantle of delicate threads however that may be the fluid that is taken up by the roots is not merely water but water plus dissolved mineral matter and nitrogen at the same time as the roots are thus absorbing liquid nutriment the leaves pierced with thousands of little stomata or mouths take in atmospheric air which is compounded chiefly of the gases oxygen and carbon the leaf cells containing the green coloring matter chlorophyll seize hold of the carbon and release the oxygen the carbon is then combined with the fluid from the roots by the vital chemistry of the leaves and is circulated all over the system for the sustenance of all the organs and tissues the flowering of the trees varies so greatly that it can only be dealt with satisfactorily as each species is described it may be stated however that all the true forest trees are wind fertilized and therefore have inconspicuous greenish blossoms by true forest trees we mean those that alone or slightly mixed are capable of forming high forest the smaller trees such as crab rowan cherry blackthorn hawthorn buckthorn etc belong more to the open woodland to the common and the hedgerow these from their habitat can be seen singly and therefore can make use of the conspicuous flowers that are fertilized by insects end of preface and introductory section one of wayside and woodland trees a pocket guide to the british silva by edward stepp this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 1. Native Trees and Shrubs, Part 1. The Oak, Quercus Robur. When good John Evelyn wrote his Silva, or A Discourse of Forest Trees, he was greatly concerned lest our wooden walls should diminish in strength for want of a succession of stout oaks in our woodlands, and therefore he put the oak in the forefront of his discourse today steel and teak have largely supplanted oak in the building of our navy and our walls of defense are no longer of wood yet in spite of these changes and the consequent reduction of the oak's importance 
we must still look upon it as the typical british tree and regardless of its place in botanical classifications we shall follow the lead of our master and place it first on our list there is no necessity for entering upon a minute description of the botanical characters of so well known a tree the sturdy massive trunk firm as a rock the broad rounded outline of its head caused by the downward sweeping extremities of the wide spreading lower limbs the wavy outline of the lobed leaves and the equally distinct egg and cup shaped fruit these are characters that cannot be confused with those of any other tree and are the most familiar objects in the landscape in most parts of our islands to my mind no wood is so awe-inspiring as one filled with old oaks all so much alike yet each with a distinct individuality we regard with reverence a human centenarian who may have nothing beyond his great age to commend him to us but we think of the long period of history of which he has been a spectator possibly an active maker of history the huge oak has probably lived through ten or twenty such periods compared with the oak man is of but mushroom growth it does not produce an acorn until sixty or seventy years old and even then it is not mature not till a century and a half have passed over its head is its timber fit for use and as a rule it is not felled under the age of two hundred years many trees are left to a much greater age or we should not have still with us so many venerable specimens and where they have not been left until partially decayed the timber is found to be still very valuable when finally cut down of one of these patriarchs of the forest cut down in the year eighteen ten we have figures of quantity and value from a contemporary record it was known as the galenos oak and stood about four miles from newport monmouthshire when felled it yielded two thousand four hundred twenty six cubic feet of sound timber and six tons of bark it was bought just as it stood for four hundred five pounds and the purchaser had to pay eighty two pounds for labor for stripping felling and converting into timber five men were employed for twenty days in stripping the bark and felling the tree and after that a pair of sawyers working six days a week were five months cutting it up but the bark realized two hundred pounds and the timber about four hundred pounds the timber and bark from this one tree were about equal to the average produce of three acres of oak coppice after fifteen years growth full-grown oaks vary in height from sixty to one hundred and thirty feet the difference depending upon situation the tallest of course being those that have been drawn up in forests at the expense of their branches trees growing freely in the open are of less height and are made to appear comparative dwarfs by the huge proportions of the bole in the forest this may be no more than ten feet in girth but in isolated specimens may be as much as fifty-four feet cowthorpe oak with a much broader base the thick rough bark is deeply furrowed in a large network pattern which affords temporary hiding places for insects the branches are much given to turn and zigzag from side to side a character that makes them very useful in boat building as knees of various angles may be cut from them without having recourse to bending the best knees are to be obtained from oaks grown in the hedgerow the oak flowers in april or may and the blossoms are of two distinct forms male and female the males are in little clusters which are borne at intervals along a hanging stalk two or three inches in length they are green and therefore inconspicuous but examined separately they will be found to have a definite calyx whose margin is cut into an uncertain number four to seven of lobes there are no petals but attached to the sides of the calyx there are ten stamens the female flowers are fewer and will be found on short erect stalks above the male catkins each female flower consists of a calyx invested by a number of overlapping scales and enclosing an ovary with three styles the ovary is divided into three cells each containing two seed eggs an acorn should therefore contain six kernels but as a rule only one of the seed eggs develops though occasionally an acorn contains two kernels the overlapping scales at the base of the female flower become the rough cup that holds the acorn the oak is subject to a considerable amount of variation probably due to the differences of situation soil etc and some authors have sought to elevate certain of the varieties into species by giving them distinctive names 
it does not appear to be certain however that these forms are at all constant and they are connected by intermediate forms that make the identification of many individuals a matter of difficulty in one of these forms cecilliflora the stalk of the acorns connecting them with the branch is very short but the leaves have a distinct foot stalk from half an inch to an inch long this form is more plentiful in the north and west and is conspicuous in the forest of dean a second form known as pedunculata has the leaf stalk short or absent the base of the leaf broad and somewhat heart-shaped and the stalk upon which the acorns are borne very long a third form intermedia commonly known as dermast has short leaf stalks short stalks to the acorns and the underside of the leaf downy pedunculata is found more on the lower hills and the sides of valleys whilst cecifolora prefers higher ground with a southern or western aspect the oak is most abundant on clay soils but is at its best when growing in deep sandy loam where there is also plenty of humus its roots in such soil strike down to a depth of five feet and therefore it thrives in association with beech whose roots are much nearer the surface and whose fallen leaves supply it with humus the oak is more persistently attacked by insects than any other tree one authority leunus has tabulated the species that get their living mainly or entirely from their attacks on the foliage timber or bark and they number about five hundred with some species this warfare is waged on so extensive a scale that in some years by early summer the oaks are almost divested of their foliage and a new crop of leaves becomes a necessity but the reserve forces of the oak are quite equal to this drain and the tree does not appear to suffer though a much less thorough attack would be serious to a conifer one of the worst of these oak spoilers though it by no means restricts its energies to attacks on this tree is the mottled umber moth hibernia defoliaria whose pretty caterpillars may be seen hanging by silken threads from the leafless twigs a striking oak insect is the stag beetle lucanus servus which in warm evenings in the south of england may be seen flying round the oaks the size and antler-like jaws of the male arousing feelings of respect in the minds of those who are not acquainted with its habits the formidable-looking horns are usually harmless the beetle spends its larval stage in the wood of unhealthy oaks and when mature seeks his hornless mate among its foliage perhaps the most interesting of the oaks pensioners to the woodland rambler will be the varied forms of gall on different parts of the tree there is the so-called oak apple of uneven surface and spongy to the touch which certain people still wear on may twenty ninth in honor of charles the second the well-rounded hard bullet gall of cynips calari the artichoke gall of cynips gemmae the spangle galls of neuroterus lenticularis so plentiful on the back of the leaf and the root gall of biorisa optera all these galls are abnormal growths due to the irritation set up by the gall wasps named when they pierced the young tissues in order to lay their eggs in them where any of these galls are perforated it may be known that the gall wasp whose grub fed within has flown but where there is no such perforation the grub is still within feeding upon the flesh of the gall or in the chrysalis stage awaiting translation to the winged condition several oaks of foreign origin are also grown in our parks and open spaces among them the holm oak quercus elix whose evergreen leathery leaves have toothed or plain edges and occasionally the lower ones develop marginal spines whence its name of holm or holly oak it is notable for retaining its lower branches so that its appearance as loudon remarks even when fully grown is that of an immense bush rather than that of a timber tree it is a native of southern europe and north africa and appears to have been introduced about the middle of the sixteenth century it usually attains a height of from twenty to thirty feet but occasionally specimens are seen up to sixty feet it has a much thinner more even bark than that of our native oak and of a black color the long brown acorns do not ripen until the second year the turkey oak quercus cerus is a much larger tree attaining to similar heights to our british oak but easily distinguishable by its more pyramidal outline and its attenuated leaves 
the lance-shaped lobes of these are unequal sharp and angular and the footless acorn cups are covered with bristly or mossy looking scales the acorns which are small and exceedingly bitter rarely open till their second autumn the whole tree trunk branches and twigs is of straighter growth than quercus robur it is a native of southern europe and the levant and was introduced about one hundred and seventy years ago the spring rambler in the woods may come upon a party of woodmen stripping young oaks of their bark or felling them whilst cylinders of separated bark rest across poles in the process of drying this is the industry of barking for the purpose of the tanner when the oaks in a coppice are about sixteen years old they are most suitable for this purpose the bark then containing a larger percentage of tannin than at any other period the operation is best performed in may when the sap is in flow and should be completed between the first swelling of the leaf buds and the unrolling of the leaves if the weather is cold and damp the bark will peel the better provided there is an absence of north or east winds before the tree is cut down the bowl is stripped the first ring being taken from just above the roots to a height of two and a half feet above when the tree is felled it is cut into lengths and the bark stripped from them then all branches that are an inch or more in diameter are peeled the bark is piled to dry for a couple of weeks and is then broken into small pieces and sent away in sacks it is not alone in the use of the bark that the tannic acid of the oak is made evident it is to the presence of this that the austerity of the acorn is due and also the ink producing properties of certain oak galls everything connected with the tree gets a roughness of flavor from this same principle even that remarkable fungus the vegetable beefsteak that may be found on old oaks in autumn is impregnated with it prior regards the name of oak anglo-saxon ach as originally belonging to the fruit and only later transferred to the tree that produces it the more obvious explanation though we know that in entomological and other matters the obvious is not always the true interpretation is that ach corn signified the corn or fruit of the ach selby tells us that during the anglo-saxon rule and even for some time after the conquest oak forests were chiefly valued for the fattening of swine laws relating to pannage or the fattening of hogs in the forests were enacted during the heptarchy and by ina's statutes any person wantonly injuring or destroying an oak tree was mulcted in a fine varying according to the size or the quantity of mast it produced the beech fagus sylvatica we speak of the oak as the monarch of the woods and to the beech the title mother of forests has been given to the timber merchant the beech has little importance but the grower of timber freely acknowledges his heavy indebtedness to this nursing mother for in the words of professor gayer the bavarian forestry expert without beech there can no more be properly tended forests of broad-leaved genera as along with it would have to be given up many other valuable timber trees whose production is only possible with the aid of beech quite apart from utilitarian considerations we should be very sorry to lose the beech with its towering massive shaft clad in smooth gray bark its spreading roots above the soil and the dense shade of its fine foliage fortunately for the lover of natural beauty it is this luxuriant growth of leaves and the shade it gives that are the redeeming virtues of the beech in the eye of the forester its drip destroys most of the soil exhausting weeds its shade protects the soil from over evaporation and the heavy crop of leaves enriches it by their decomposition on these points the forestry experts of today join hands with john evelyn who nearly two hundred fifty years ago thus referred to it the shade unpropitious to corn and grass but sweet and of all the rest most refreshing to the weary shepherd lentus in umbra echoing amaryllis with his oaten pipe and again after giving us a long catalogue of the varied uses to which beechwood may be put he adds yet for all this you would not wonder to hear me deplore the so frequent use of this wood if you did consider that the industry of france furnishes that country for all domestic utensils with excellent walnut a material infinitely preferable to the best beech which is indeed good only for shade and for the fire in the days of open hearths and chimney corners the beech was extensively used for fuel and is still reputed to make good charcoal but today the chairmaker and the turner are the chief users of its wood 
the beech well grown attains a height of about one hundred feet and a girth of twenty feet there was until recently a beech in norbury park surrey one hundred sixty feet in height its branches horizontally spreading gave it a head of enormous proportions hooker gives the diameter of the knoll beech as three hundred fifty two feet which means a circumference of about as many yards it will grow in most upland places where the oak thrives though it does not need so deep a soil and has a preference for land containing lime fresh mineral soils rich in humus are the best for it in poor soils its growth is slow and its life is longer it begins to bear mostly at about eighteen years of age and thereafter gives good crops at intervals of three or five years in spring just before the buds expand the twigs of the beech have a very distinct appearance they are long and slender placed alternately along the twig and the brown envelopes retain their shape long after they have been cast off it is interesting to note how well these are mimicked by a glossy spindle-shaped snail clausilla laminata that has a decided fondness for the beech as the snails crawl up the bowl or over the moss at its base it is not easy at a glance to say which are snails and which bud envelopes this is one of the protective resemblances adopted by many animals to give them a chance of eluding their natural enemies in this case the thrush and other birds in the bud the leaf is folded fanwise and the folds run parallel with the nerves they expand into an oval smooth-faced leaf with slightly scooped edges and a most delicate fringe of short gossamer which falls off later these leaves evelyn recommended as a stuffing for beds declaring that if gathered about the fall and somewhat before they are much frost bitten they afford the best and easiest mattresses in the world to lay under our quilts instead of straw in switzerland i have sometimes lain on them to my great refreshment that last clause seems to imply that the authorities at home would not allow the introduction of new-fangled bed stuffings but remained true to straw these leaves are rich in potash and as they readily decay they produce an admirable humus in sheltered places the leaves turned to a light ruddy brown color are retained on the lower branches until cast off by the expansion of the new buds in early summer whilst the leaves are still pellucid the shade of a big beech is particularly inviting later the leaves become opaque and their glossy surfaces throw back the heat rays then the play of light upon the great mass of foliage is very fine but when autumn has turned their deep green to orange and warm ruddy brown and they catch the red rays of the westering sun the tree appears to be turned into a blazing fire the beech flowers in april or may the blossoms are rather more conspicuous than is the case with the oak for the male flowers are gathered together in a hanging purplish brown rounded tassel with yellow anthers the female flowers to the number of two three or four are clustered in a cupel of overlapping scales like those of the oak but in the beech the cupel becomes a bristly enclosed box which afterwards opens by one end splitting into four triangular silk hair lined valves which turn back and reveal the three-sided sharp-edged mast this mast was formerly a very valuable product of the beech woods when herds of swine were turned in them to feed upon the fallen beech nuts agricultural methods have changed but though our hogs are now confined in styes and fed a diet that more rapidly fattens beech mast is still a good food eagerly taken by such woodland denizens as badgers deer squirrels and dormice the vitality of the beech is so high that quite frequently the bowl divides at its upper part into several trunks which rise straight up and each attains the dimensions of a complete tree often such a tree stands on a sandy bank and seems in imminent danger of toppling over but its uprightness secures it against strain and the roots that it sent down the steep side of the bank have thickened into strong props many such trees may be found along the hollow lanes in the green sand district of surrey and we have more than once sheltered from a storm under their roots we have already mentioned the value of the beech as a nurse for other trees and its frequent use for that purpose but it should also be stated that it is a powerful competitor with other trees and if these are left to fight their own battles unaided the beech will be the conqueror evelyn saw this more than two centuries ago and pointed out that where mixed woods of oak and beech were left to themselves they ultimately became pure beech woods the beech appears to gain this advantage through rooting in the surface soil and exhausting it of food elements suffers none to penetrate 
to the lower strata where the oak has its roots a number of insects feed upon the beech but they are mostly more beautiful or more singular than destructive the copper beech which is so effectively used for ornament in parks is merely a sub variety of the common beech and all the examples in cultivation are believed to be sports from the purple variety which itself was a natural sport discovered in a german wood little more than a hundred years ago the modern word beech is derived from the anglo-saxon bach bitch boch which had very similar equivalents in all branches of the german and scandinavian family and from the fact that the literature of these people was inscribed on tablets of beech our word book has the same origin the birch betula alba the lady of the woods as coleridge christened the birch is at once the most graceful the hardiest and the most ubiquitous of our forest trees it grows throughout the length and breadth of our island and seems happy alike on a london common in a suburban garden or far up in the scottish highlands twenty five hundred feet it penetrates farther north than any other tree and its presence is a great boon to the natives of lapland it will grow where it is subjected to great heat as well as where it must endure extreme cold with its slender roots exploring the beds of peat the rich humus of the old wood or the raw soil of the mountainside where it has to cling to rocks and a few mosses given plenty of light and it seems to care for little else though a mere shrub in the far north with us the birch has a trunk sometimes as tall as eighty but more frequently fifty feet and a girth of from two to three feet in its first decade it increases in height at the rate of a foot and a half or two feet in a year but of course there is little breadth to be built up at the same time it reaches maturity in a half of century and before the other half is reached the birch will have passed away the bark of the birch is more enduring than its timber which may be partly due to its habit of casting off the outer layer in shreds like fine tissue paper from time to time the greater part of the bark is silvery white which adds to the apparent slenderness of the tree and makes it conspicuous from a long distance for the attenuated and drooping branches dressed in small and loosely hung leaves sway so constantly that the trunk is scarcely hidden the glossy leathery leaves vary in shape from a triangular form to a pointed oval their edges doubly toothed and their footstalks long and slender about april the hanging catkins of the birch which were in evidence in the previous autumn have matured and become dark crimson the scales separate and expose the two stamens of each flower which has a single sepal the female flowers are in a short more erect spike which consists of overlapping scales bracts each containing two or three flowers the flowers have neither petals nor sepals each consisting merely of an ovary with two slender styles after fertilization the female spike has developed into a little oblong cone the minute nuts have a pair of delicate wings to each and as they are set free from the cones they flutter on the breeze like a swarm of small flies the moss that usually covers the ground beneath the birch will be found in october to be thickly speckled with these fruits which are something more than seeds as they are commonly termed they are really analogous to the acorn a nut within a thin shell the tree sometimes begins to produce seed when only fifteen years old but as a rule it is ten years older before it bears and thereafter it has a crop every year it is strange how so striking and graceful a tree could have been so persistently ignored by the old school of landscape painters when one remembers with what good effect modern artists have utilized it in this connection we need not apologize for quoting at length a description of the tree from the artist's point of view because it also gives attention to those points one would like the rambler to notice mr p g hammerton in his sylvan year says the stem of the silver birch is one of the masterpieces of nature everything has been done to heighten its unrivalled brilliance the horizontal peeling of the bark making dark rings at irregular distances the brown spots the dark color of the small twigs the rough texture near the ground and the exquisite silky smoothness of the tight white bands above offer exactly that variety of contrast which makes us feel a rare quality like that smooth whiteness as strongly as we are capable of feeling it and amongst the common effects in all northern countries one of the most brilliant is the opposition of birch trunks in sunshine against the deep blue or purple of a mountain distance in the shadow at all seasons of the year the beauty of the birch is attractive and peculiarly its own 
the young beech may remind you of it occasionally under strong effects of light and is also very graceful but we have no tree that rivals the birch in its own qualities of color and form still less in that air and bearing which are so much more difficult to describe in winter you see the full delicacy of the sprays that the lightest foliage hides and in early spring this tree clothes itself next after the willow with tiny triangular leaves inexpressibly light in the mass so that from a distance they have the effect of a green mist rather than anything more material when the tree is isolated sufficiently to come against the sky you may see one of the prettiest sights in nature the pure deep azure of heaven with the silvery white and fresh green of the birch in opposition and yet it is not a crude green for there is a good deal of warm red in it which gives one of those precious tertiaries that all the true colorists value linnaeus named our common birch betula alba but more than a century ago Earhart pointed out that there were two well-defined forms of the tree which he proposed to separate as distinct species under the names of b varicosa and b pubescens hooker regards the first of these as the typical form for which he properly retains the linnaean name it is distinguished by having the base of the bowl covered with coarse rough and blackish bark the smooth leaves looking as though their base had been cut off and the twigs warty the b pubescens of Earhart appears to be a variety of fry's b glutinosa which hooker treats as a subspecies of b alba the bark at its base is smooth and white its downy leaves have a triangular base and its twigs are free from warts it sometimes assumes a bush-like form the dwarf birch betula nana is a distinct species which occurs locally in the mountainous parts of northumberland and scotland it is not a tree but a bush only two or three feet in height its firm textured round leaves have scalloped margins and short footstalks the foliage of the birch in autumn turns to a yellow hue at this period and indeed for a month earlier there may be seen beneath the birch trees one of the most striking of our toadstools the fly agaric amanita muscarios so called from its use as the lethal ingredient in the making of fly papers from a bulbous base a creamy yellow stem arises decked about half its height with an ample hanging frill the upper side of the spreading cap is painted with crimson over which are scattered flecks of white or cream kid the remains of an outer envelope that was ruptured by the expansion of the cap and of which the frill represents the lower portion this species is really poisonous and the kamkotchkins are said to make their vodka superlatively intoxicating by the addition of this fungus to it on the trunk of the birch may sometimes be found a large fungus named polyporus betulinus whose root-like portion penetrates the bark and sucks up the sap birch bark is used for tanning certain kinds of leather and the peculiar odor of russian leather is said to be due to the use of birch in its preparation the birch agrees with the beech in two respects it is of little value for timber but as a nurse to young timber trees it is of considerable importance its name is from the anglo-saxon bjork birse and signifies the bark tree End of section 1section two of wayside and woodland trees a pocket guide to the british silva by edward stepp this librivox recording is in the public domain native trees and shrubs part two the alder ulnus glutinosa although the alder is abundant by riversides and in all low-lying moist lands as far north as caithness it is not so generally well known at sight as the oak the beech and the birch it is a small tree ordinarily only thirty to forty feet in height with a girth from three to six feet though occasionally it aspires to seventy feet in height this is when it is growing in moist loam upon which rain or floods have washed down good layers of humus from woods at a higher elevation if with its roots thus well cared for its head is in a humid atmosphere the alder is in happy case if it has had the misfortune to get into a porous soil though this may be moist enough to please an ash the alder becomes merely a big bush the bark of the alder is rough and black and the wood soft 
whilst the tree is alive its wood is white but when cut and exposed to the air it becomes red finally on drying it changes to a pinkish tint as timber it has no great reputation except for piles or other submerged purposes when it is said to be exceedingly durable it has also enjoyed a great reputation for making the best charcoal for the gunpowder mills and it is largely used by the turner the wood carver and the cabinet maker the leaves which have short stalks and are from two to four inches long are roundish with a wedge-shaped base they have a waved and toothed margin and remain green long after the leaves of other trees have fallen in their young condition these leaves are covered with hairs and are sticky to the touch and it is to this fact that the name glutinosa has reference the flowering of the alder is very similar to that of the birch but the male catkins have red scales and each flower four stamens the female spikes have the fleshy scales covered by red brown bracts of a woody consistence which persist after the fruit has dropped out of them seed is not produced until the alder is twenty years old and the crop is repeated almost every year after the cones are ripe about october or november when they scatter their fruit but the empty ones persist in hanging to the branches throughout the winter in numbers sufficient to give the leafless tree a brown appearance from a little distance the immature male catkins are in evidence at the same time there is a variety incisa of the alder in which the leaves are so deeply toothed that they bear a close resemblance to those of the hawthorn in some localities the tree is called the howler and aller the latter word apparently the original name for its anglo-saxon forms were aller aller and aller the hornbeam carpinus betulus the hornbeam is frequently passed by as a beech to which it has a very close superficial likeness but a comparison of leaves flowers or bowl would at once make the differences obvious it is usually found in similar situations to the beech though it does not ascend so far up the hills as that species on dry poor soils it does not attain its full proportions and may only be classed as a small tree but when growing on low ground in rich loam or good clay it reaches a height of seventy feet with a girth of ten feet if two measurements of the bowl's diameter be taken at right angles to each other they will be found to differ greatly a section of the trunk will not show a circular outline but rather an ellipse the bowl appearing to have been flattened on two sides it is coated with a smooth gray bark usually spotted with white the leaves are less symmetrical than those of beech and are broader towards the base they are of rougher texture hairy on the underside and their edges are doubly toothed in autumn they turn yellow then to ruddy gold but a few days later they have settled into the rusty hue they retain throughout the winter in those cases where they remain on the tree until spring the wood is exceedingly tough and not to be worked up with ease but it is considered to make admirable fuel evelyn says it burns like a candle there are those who say that the name hornbeam has reference to the tough or horn-like character of its beams others declare that in the days when bullocks were yoked to the plough the yoke was made of this wood as being fitted by its toughness to stand the strain and as it was attached to the horns it became the horn beam a third theory is that the name was derived from ornus the manna ash with which early botanists confused it but with all respect to the authority of dr pryor who favors it we prefer to stand on the first suggestion with old john gerard who says herbal sixteen thirty three in time it waxeth so hard that the toughness and hardness of it may be rather compared to horn than unto wood and therefore it was called hornbeam or hardbeam the carpenter is not pleased who has hornbeam to work up for his tools lose their edge far too quickly for his labor to be profitable evelyn tells us that it was called by some the horse beech from the resemblance of the leaves 
the two kinds of catkins are similar and cylindrical but whilst the male is pendulous from the beginning the female is erect until after the formation of the fruit when it gradually assumes the hanging position the bracts of the male are oval with sharp tips each containing an uncertain three to twelve number of stamens in the female the bracts fall early but their place is taken by three lobed bracteoles which enlarge after flowering and become an inch or an inch and a half long a single flower occupies each bracteole consisting of a two-celled ovary and two styles only one cell develops so that the hard green fruit contains but one seed the appearance of these fruits in autumn as they hang in a spray from the underside of the branches is quite distinct from those of any other of our native trees the hornbeam's title to be considered indigenous has had some doubts thrown upon it because there are some records of specimens having been introduced during the fifteenth century but that is not sufficient ground upon which to deny nationality we have known persons to bring home from distant parts as treasures wild plants and ferns that were growing within a mile of their own homes it appears to be a real native of the southern and midland counties of england and of wales a line drawn across the map from north wales to norfolk roughly marks the limit north of that line the hornbeam appears to have been planted as also in ireland the hazel corallus avellana it is rarely that the hazel is allowed in this country to develop into a tree as a rule it is a shrub forming undergrowth in wood or copse or part of a hedge as it is cut down with the copse or hedge it cannot form a standard of any size but that the hazel left alone will develop into a small tree is shown by an example in eastwell park kent whose height a few years ago was thirty feet with a circumference of three feet round the bowl as soon as the nuts are formed the bush is easily identified by all so that a description of its character is hardly necessary the large roundish heart-shaped leaves are arranged alternately in two rows along the straight downy shoots their margins are doubly toothed and when in the bud they are plated the folds being parallel to the midrib soon after the buds open many of the leaves assume a purplish tint for a while in autumn they turn brown and finally pale to yellow before the leaves appear the hazel is rendered conspicuous by the male catkins which are familiar to country children under the name of lamb's tails these may be seen in an undeveloped condition in the autumn when the nuts are being sought a cluster of two or three hard little gray-green cylinders is all that may then be seen of them but throughout the winter they lengthen their scales loosen and in february they are a couple of inches long pliant and yellow with the abundant pollen which blows out of them as they swing the female flowers are by no means conspicuous and have to be looked for they will be found in the form of swollen buds on the upper parts of the shoots and branches from which issue some fine crimson threads these are the styles and stigmas and on dissection of the bud like head each pair of styles will be seen to spring from a two-celled ovary nestling between the bracts or scales of which the head is composed it is only rarely that the seed egg in each cell develops as a rule one shrivels and the other develops into the sweet kernel of the hazelnut the shell is the ovary that has become woody and hard the ragged edged leathery shuck is the enlarged bracts that surround the minute flower the hazel likes a good soil and will not really flourish without it though it will grow almost anywhere except where the moisture is stagnant its wood is said to be best when grown on a chalky subsoil of course as timber the hazel does not count but its tough and pliant rods and staves are valuable for many small uses such as the making of hoops for casks walking sticks and divining rods the bark is smooth and brown the barcelona nut imported so largely in winter is only a variety of the hazel as also the cob and the filbert so largely cultivated in kent the name is the anglo-saxon hazel or hazel and signifies a baton of authority from the use of its rods in driving cattle and slaves 
the lime tilia platophyllos those persons who obtain their ideas of trees mainly from the specimens they can see in suburban roads and gardens are in danger of getting quite a false impression of the lime it is a long-suffering good-tempered tree and like human individuals of similar temperament it is subjected to shameful treatment the suburban gardener who has a row of limes to trim uses the saw and amputates every arm close up to the shoulder so that when the season of budding and burgeoning arrives the row of limes will look like an upward extension in green of the brick wall such are the atrocities upon which suburbia has to base its ideas of one of the most imposing of trees the large-leaved lime growing in parkland or meadow with its roots deep in good light loam and its head eighty or ninety feet above is quite another matter such a tree is a thing of beauty and one can stand long at its base looking up among the wide spreading limbs so well clothed with leaves of fine texture and tint the girth of such a specimen at four feet from the ground would be about fifteen feet larger individuals have been recorded up to twenty seven feet there are three kinds of lime in general cultivation in this country but the differences between them are not great they are the large leaved tilia platophyllos the small leaved t parvifolia and the intermediate or common line t vulgaris the last named is generally admitted to be an introduced kind and it is the one most commonly planted respecting the claims of the other two to rank as natives there has been some difference of opinion among authorities the small leaved lime which does not occur in woods north of cumberland was regarded by borer as a true indigene but h c watson considered its claims as open to doubt though he had no such doubt of the large leaved lime which is only growing really wild in the woods of herefordshire radnorshire and the west riding of yorkshire all our limes have similar straight tall stems clad in smooth bark and with a similar habit of growth they are trees that demand genial climatic conditions for their proper development and in consequence they do not put forth their leaves until may the period of their leafy glory is comparatively short for they are among the trees that lose their leaves earliest in autumn after having been for a few days transmuted into gold the leaf of the lime is heart-shaped with one of the basal lobes larger than the other and the edges cut into saw-like teeth there are slight differences in those of the three species which will be indicated below in its floral arrangements the lime differs from the trees previously mentioned in that it has distinct sepals and petals an abundance of honey and strong sweet fragrance as of honeysuckle unlike them it does not trust to so rough and ready an agent of fertilization as the wind so that it waits until its boughs are well clothed with leaves before putting forth its yellowish white blossoms these are in clusters cymes of six or seven the stalks of all arising from one very long and stouter stalk which is attached for half its length to a thin and narrow bract individually regarded the flowers will be found to consist of five sepals five petals and oval ovary with a style ending in a five-toothed stigma and surrounded by a large number of stamens the stamens discharge their pollen before the stigma of that flower is fitted to receive it so that cross fertilization is ensured by the visits of the innumerable bees that visit the flowers for the abundant nectar they contain and which the bees convert into a first-rate honey the flowers are succeeded by globose little fruits each about a quarter of an inch across yellow and covered with pale down in a good season these will be found to contain one or two seeds but too often in this country the summers are too cool to ripen them the lime does not begin to bear until about its thirty-fifth year it flowers every year thereafter but the question of its seed crop depends entirely upon the weather for the purposes to which large timber is usually put the light white wood of the lime is not highly esteemed not being considered of sufficient durability yet it serves for many smaller uses where its lightness and fine grain are strong recommendations 
it must not be forgotten that the wonderful carvings of grinling gibbons were executed in this wood it is largely used by the makers of musical instruments and as every one knows it is from the inner bark of the lime that those useful bast mats which are imported from russia in such large numbers are made probably owing to its lightness again the wood was used in old times for making bucklers the question of its value as timber is probably never taken into account when it is planted in this country where its ornamental appearance as an avenue or shade tree is its great recommendation it is one of the long-lived trees its full life period being certainly five centuries those in st james's park are popularly supposed to have been planted at the suggestion of john evelyn somewhere about the year sixteen sixty there is a fine lime avenue in bushy park probably planted by dutch william deer and cattle are fond of the foliage and young shoots if they can get at them numerous insects exhibit a like partiality of these the caterpillar of the large and handsome lime hawk moth smyrinthus tiliae is the most characteristic the differences between the three species may be briefly noted small-leaved lime tilia parvifolia does not attain the large proportions of the others leaves about two inches across smooth on the lower surface the axles of the nerves are glaucous and downy with hairy patches between nerves fruit thin-shelled and brittle downy and very faintly ribbed the upper leaves show a tendency to lobing large-leaved lime tilia platophyllos bark rougher twigs hairy leaves larger four inches and rougher downy beneath axles of the nerves woolly fruit of more oval shape woody and strongly ribbed when ripe common lime tilia vulgaris intermediates between the others leaves larger than those of t parvifolia smaller than those of t platophyllos downy in axles beneath twigs smooth fruit woody but without ribs the name lime was originally lind a form which with the addition of n is in use today chaucer and other english writers spell it line and line and the transition from this form to that commonly used today has been affected by changing the n to m originally it meant pliant and had reference to the useful bast from which cordage and other flexible things were made the witch elm ulmus montana of the two species of elms commonly grown in these islands this alone is a native though the common or small-leaved elm ulmus campestris was introduced from the continent by the romans so that it has had time to get itself widely distributed over our country other names for the witch elm are mountain elm scots elm and witch hazel the last named being now more generally applied to an american plant the hamamelis the philologists appear to be uncertain as to the origin and meaning of which but it seems most probably a form of which just as a hazel rod is used by water finders who declare that its movements indicate the presence of hidden springs so a wand of ulmus montana may have furnished the witch finder with a witch hazel for the detection of witches the names montana campestris and mountain elm must not be allowed to mislead us as to the habits of the two species for though the witch elm is known to reach an altitude of thirty three hundred feet in the alps here it ascends to only thirteen hundred feet yorkshire while ulmus campestris which might be understood to be less a hill climber grows at an elevation of fifteen hundred feet in derbyshire as a matter of fact both species are much fonder of valleys than of mountains the witch elm forms a trunk of large size from eighty to one hundred twenty feet or more in height with a girth of fifty feet and covered with rough bark that is often corky its long slender branches spread widely with a downward tendency the downy forking twigs bearing their leaves in a straight row along each side the leaves are somewhat oval in general form but the two sides of the midrib are unequal in size and shape 
their edges are doubly or trebly toothed and the surfaces are rough and harsh to the touch the hairs that cover the strong ribs on the under surface serve for the protection of the breathing pores from dust on leaves of the pendulous form of this tree grown in the london parks and gardens these hairs will be found to be quite black with the soot particles gathered from the air trees need carbon but in this gross form they are too often suffocated by it in march or april the brownish flowers are produced in bunches from the sides of the branches they are a quarter of an inch long bell-shaped their edges cut into lobes and finely fringed the ovary with its two owl-shaped styles is surrounded by four or five stamens with purple anthers they appear in march or april before the leaf buds have opened and are dependent on the wind for the transfer of pollen the fruit is an oblong samara about an inch long this consists of a single seed in the center invested by a thin envelope which is extended all round as a light membranous wing which gives it buoyancy and enables it to float through the air to a little distance these seeds are not produced until about the thirtieth year of the tree's life and though they are ripened almost annually thereafter good crops are biennial or triennial only it has often been stated that the witch elm does not send up suckers but it does though not invariably it does so chiefly as the result of root pruning or some other check to the extension of the root system the elm most frequently seen is the small leaved elm ulmus campestris which is therefore entitled to its alternative name of common elm constantly grown as a hedgerow tree it meets us at every turn though it is much less plentiful in scotland than in other parts of the united kingdom it is in all respects very similar to the witch elm but its leaves are smaller usually from two to three inches long the twigs often covered with a corky bark and the seed instead of being in the center of the samara is much nearer to the notched end the leaves are proportionately narrower than those of montana and it will be found that the hairs which cover the midrib below possess in minor degree the irritating qualities of the nettles stings this is a fact not generally known but i became painfully aware of it a few years ago when clearing away the suckers of an elm that were encroaching too much upon my garden border examination of these hairs show that they are constructed much on the same plan as those of the nettle a member of the same natural order by the way the fact that these leaves are browsed by cattle and deer may explain this development of the hairs which whilst they may serve to keep off sheep have not yet reached a degree of acridity sufficient to protect them from the larger beasts both flowers and samaras are about a third smaller than those of montana but seed is very seldom produced in this country and the tree seeks to reproduce itself by throwing up abundant suckers round the base of the bowl and even from the root branches at a considerable distance from the trunk these of course if allowed to grow would soon surround the tree with cops campestris often attains a greater height with its straighter trunk than mentana but its girth is not so great seldom being more than twenty feet its dark wood is harder and finer grained than that produced by the native tree its favor as a hedgerow tree is probably due to the fact that it gives shade which is not obnoxious to the growth of grass both species are subject to a great amount of variation and in nursery men's catalogues these forms have appropriate names but they are not regarded as of sufficient permanence to merit scientific distinction in point of age elms are known to exceed five hundred years among the insects that feed upon the elms foliage the most noteworthy is the caterpillar of the fine large tortoiseshell butterfly vanessa polychloros i have already mentioned the relationship subsisting between elms and nettles and it is a point worth noting that nearly all our native species of vanessa feed in the larval state upon the leaves of the nettle in london parks and squares the elms are much infested by the caterpillars of the vaporer moth whose wingless females may be seen like short-legged spiders on the bark whilst the male flutters in an apparently aimless way on wings of rich brown with central white spots in october the leaves which have for some time assumed a very dull dark green tint suddenly turn to orange then fade to pale yellow and fall in showers the name elm was derived from the latin ulmus 
and appears to indicate an instrument of punishment probably from its rods having been used to belabor slaves prior remarks that the word is nearly identical in all the germanic and scandinavian dialects but does not find its root in any of them it plays through all the vowels but stands isolated as a foreign word which they have adopted this playing through the vowels may be thus illustrated alm alm and elm anglo-saxon and english ilm olm and ulm in various german dialects end of section two section three of wayside and woodland trees a pocket guide to the british silva by edward stepp this librivox recording is in the public domain section three native trees and shrubs part three the ash fraxinus excelsior so commanding yet at the same time so light and graceful does a well-grown ash appear that gilpin called it the venus of the woods this may appear to some to be rather too close an approach to the lady of the woods birch but in our opinion it well expresses the characteristics of the two they are both exceedingly graceful but the beauty of the birch is that of the nymph whilst that of the ash is the combined grace and strength of the goddess i have said a well-grown ash a phrase by which the timberman would understand a tree that had been hemmed in so closely by other trees that it has had no chance of developing as a tree but only as a straight stout stick of wood from eighty to one hundred feet long my well-grown ash is in a meadow where both soil and atmosphere are moist and cool where it has had elbow room to reach its long graceful arms upwards and outwards and to cover them with the plumy circlets of long leaves it is there or on the outskirts of the wood or in the hedgerow that the ash is able to do credit to gilpin's name for it before the reign of iron and steel was quite so universal ash timber was in demand for many uses where the metals have now supplanted it it was then far more widely grown as a hedgerow tree than is now the case selby laments the neglect of this former custom which kept up a supply of tough and elastic timber useful in all agricultural operations and added much to the beauty of the country no doubt the noxious drip and shade of the ash have had much to do with this abandonment of it for few things can live beneath it a condition helped by its numerous fibrous roots which quickly exhaust and drain the soil and so starve out other plants although it thus drains the surface soil it is not dependent upon these upper layers for food for its much branched roots extend very deeply in the porous soils it prefers it must not be supposed from the foregoing remarks that the ash is confined to the lowlands in yorkshire it is found growing at an elevation of one thousand three hundred fifty feet in mid-germany it grows as far up as three thousand five hundred feet and in the alpine districts five hundred feet higher still it has a preference for the northern and eastern sides of hills where the atmosphere is moist and cool and the soil deep and porous for it loves free and not stagnant moisture for its roots the bark of both trunk and branches is pale gray and some look to this as the origin of the tree's english name on examining the leafless branches in early spring two things strike the observer the blackness of the big opposite leaf buds and the stoutness of the twigs this latter fact is due to the great size of the leaves that they have to support which implies a considerable strain in wind or rain what are generally regarded as the leaves of the ash are only leaflets though they are equal in size to the leaves of most of our trees the largest of the leaflets are about three inches in length and there are from four to seven mostly six pairs and an odd terminal one to each leaf they are lance shaped with toothed edges the leaves are late in appearing but like charles lamb and his office hours they make up for it by an early departure the flowers of the ash are very poor affairs for they have neither calyx nor corolla 
though their association in large clusters makes them fairly conspicuous as they droop from the sides of the branches in april or may stamens and pistils are borne by the same or separate flowers and both kinds or one only may be found on the same tree the pistil is a greenish yellow pear-shaped body and the stamens are very dark purple the flowers are succeeded by bunches of keys each one when ripe a narrow oblong scale with a notch at one end and a seed lying within at the other the correct name for these is samaras in looking at a bunch of these keys they are something like the keys to the primitive locks of the ancients one is struck by the fact that they all have a little twist in the wing or sail which causes the key to spin steadily on the wind and reach the earth seed end first they are therefore sometimes known as spinners these are ripe in october but though the trees produce seed nearly every year after the fortieth one may chance to look at a dozen ashes before he comes upon one that bears a seed the reason for this lies in the fact that some trees have no female blossoms the seeds do not germinate until the second spring after they are sown much of the ash wood in use for carriage poles oars axe and hammer shafts and similar purposes where only small diameters are needed are obtained from the ash coppice which rapidly produces well-developed poles so strong and elastic is the ash timber when taken from young trees that it is claimed it will bear a greater strain than any other european timber of equal thickness the ash is not one of the long-lived trees its natural span being about two hundred years but its wood is regarded as best between the ages of thirty and sixty years cattle and horses are fond of ash leaves which were formerly much used for fodder and still are in some districts but it is said that to indulge cows in this food is fatal to the production of good butter from their milk in some country places there is still extant a shrew ash a tree into which a hole has been bored sufficiently large to admit a living shrew mouse which has then been plugged in to die of suffocation a touch of a leaf from this tree was reputed to cure cramp but especially that form of it supposed to be caused by a shrew passing over man or beast then there was the ash whose bowl had been cleft that it might be a sovereign remedy for infantile hernia it is difficult to account for the origin of these ideas but they are deep-rooted and die hard john evelyn remarks of this latter superstition i have heard it affirmed with great confidence and upon experience that the rupture to which many children are obnoxious is healed by passing the infant through a wide cleft in the bowl or stem of a growing ash tree it is then carried a second time round the ash and caused to repass the same aperture as before the rupture of the child being bound up it is supposed to heal as the cleft of the tree closes and coalesces the origin of the name ash is uncertain though many fanciful suggestions have been made in explanation of its meaning its anglo-saxon form was ashk a word used by the same people for spear but that was because their spear shafts were made of ash wood the maple acer campestre there are a number of maples in cultivation but only three of them are commonly met with in the open and of these one alone is native that is the small-leaved common or field maple acer campestre a small tree that attains a height of twenty or thirty feet in the tall hedgerow or in the wood but is most familiar as a mere bush or as a constituent of the low field hedge does not grow to any considerable thickness of bowl so has no importance as timber but the turner the cabinet maker and the artist in fancy pipes and snuff boxes are glad to make use of its fine-grained pale brown wood this is often beautifully veined especially the wood from the roots and as it will take a high polish which brings out these markings plainly it is a very desirable wood for such purposes the brown bark gives little clue to the character of the wood it covers for in young trees it is rough and deeply fissured though with age it becomes smooth the leaves vary greatly in size those growing on a tree being much larger than those produced by a bush they range from two to four inches in diameter and are always in pairs springing from the sides of the branch exactly opposite to each other 
the general form of the leaf is kidney shaped but it is cut up into five lobes which are more or less toothed they are downy when young of a deep green color but too frequently this is disguised by a thick layer of road dust in october they turn to a rich yellow and the maple is then prominent even in a distant view for the bright color of the foliage makes the tree stand out prominently in strong contrast with the still deep green of the oaks or firs beyond the maples are among the trees that have complete flowers although in this case they happen to be greenish yellow they are about a quarter of an inch across have narrow sepals and narrower petals eight stamens and two lobe flattened ovary that develops into a pair of broad winged keys or samaras these are individually much like those of the ash but unsymmetrical and curved half an inch long with their bases joined together sometimes in late summer these keys take on a coloring of deep crimson previous to turning brown as they ripen as a rule the contained seeds take eighteen months to germinate though a few may start growth in the first spring the common maple is thought to be indigenous only from the county of durham to the southern coast and in ireland in scotland it is only an introduced plant that has become naturalized the great maple sycamore or false plane acer pseudoplantanus is not a native tree but it appears to have been introduced from the continent as far back as the fifteenth century so that it has had time during the intervening centuries to get well established among us and by means of its winged seeds to distribute itself to remote corners of our islands it appears to be fond of exposed situations growing to a large size even near the sea where the salt-laden gales destroy all other deciduous trees recently in ireland we ascended a hill where the planting of pines and other trees had resulted in comparative failure and found that the wind-borne seeds of the sycamore had produced a large number of young trees which will probably serve later as nurses for more desirable timber producers the close-grained firm wood which can be worked with ease is not highly esteemed its name of false plain is due to the scots calling it the plain misled of old by the similarity of the leaves and the fact that patches of the fine ash gray bark flake off as in the true plain showing other tints it grows to a height of sixty or even eighty feet so quickly that it is full grown when only fifty or sixty years old though it is supposed to live from a hundred and fifty to two hundred and fifty years like that of the common maple the wood of the sycamore is firm and fine-grained which does credit to the efforts of the french polisher the leaves are more heart-shaped but cut into five lobes whose edges are unequally toothed they are six or eight inches across the flowers are similar to those of the common maple but larger and in a long hanging raceme which has a rather fine appearance the samaras are scimitar shaped and red brown about an inch and a half long these are produced freely after the tree is about twenty years old like many other maples the sycamore has sap which contains much sugar some of this appears also to exude through the leaves for they are often found to be quite sticky to the touch the black patches so frequent on sycamore leaves are the work of a small fungus ritsima asininarium the norway maple acer platinodes is a tree of much more recent 1683 introduction from the continent its height is from 30 to 60 feet and its early growth is very rapid the leaves are even larger than those of the sycamore of similar shape but the lobes are only slightly toothed the clusters of bright yellow flowers are almost erect the tree does not produce seed until it is between 40 and 50 years old the maple was the maple trial or the mapolder of the anglo-saxons it was originally the celtic maple and the name indicated those knotty excrescences on the trunk from which the cabinet maker got the mottled wood that was so highly prized in early times for the making of bowls and table tops for which fabulous prices have been paid the poplars populus almost everybody who has an elementary acquaintance with trees knows a poplar at sight the foliage being so very distinct from that of other trees but the distinctions between the several species are not so immediately obvious five kinds of poplar are commonly grown in this country of which only two are regarded as distinct indigenous species 
These are the white poplar, Populus alba, and the aspen, P. tremula. A third indigenous form, the gray poplar, P. kinsens, is thought to be either a subspecies of P. alba or a hybrid between that species and P. tremula. Then of common introduced species we have the black poplar, Populus nigra, and the Lombardi poplar, P. fastigiata. The poplars, Populus, and the willows, Salix, together constitute the natural order Salincinae. The two genera agree broadly in the construction and arrangement of their flowers and catkins, but whereas the poplars have broad leaves and drooping catkins, the willows, with few exceptions, have long slender leaves and erect catkins. The sexes are not only in distinct flowers, but on separate trees, what botanists describe by the term diaceous. The males appear to be far more numerous than the females. In the popular sense there are no flowers, for there are neither sepals nor petals, each set of sexual organs being protected merely by a scale. The catkins containing these flowers usually appear before the leaves. As there is nothing to attract insects to the work, the trees have to rely upon the wind for conveying the pollen to the female trees. The first three species described below have from four to twelve stamens. P. nigra and P. fastigiata have from twelve to twenty stamens. The poplars share the love of the willows for moist places. They are found more frequently in gardens and hedgerows than in woods. Their growth is rapid, and their timber, consequently, is of little value, though its softness and lightness render it suitable for making boxes, and its whiteness and non-liability to splinter fit it for use as flooring. An additional point in favor of white poplar for the latter purpose is its unreadiness to burn. The white poplar or abele populus alba grows into a large tree something between sixty and a hundred feet high covered with smooth gray bark its branches spread horizontally and its broad heart-shaped leaves which vary from an inch to three inches long are hung on long slender foot stalks in most trees the leaf stalks are flattened from above but in the case of the poplars they are flattened from the sides so that when moved by the wind they flutter laterally these leaves have a waved margin, a smooth upper surface, and are snowy white and cottony beneath. The leaf buds are also invested by cottony filaments. The roots produce numerous suckers, even at a distance from the trunk, and the leaves on these sucker shoots are very large, two to four inches broad, of a more triangular shape, the outline lobed and toothed. The catkins, which appear in March and April, are cylindrical. Those of the male trees may be as much as four inches long, each flower containing from six to ten stamens with purple anthers. The female catkins are not nearly so long, the two yellow stigmas are slender with slit tips, and the ovaries develop into slender egg-shaped capsules, each with its fringed scale. This species is said not to produce flowers in Scotland. In July, when the seed capsules open, the surrounding vegetation and ground are thickly strewn with the long white cotton filaments attached to the seeds. The wood of this tree is softer and more spongy than that of other poplars. The gray poplar, Populus cansens, which is thought to be indigenous only in the southeastern parts of England, is not so tall a tree as P. alba, though it sometimes attains to eighty or ninety feet, with a circumference between ten and twenty-four feet. Its life extends to about a century, but its wood, which does not split when nails are driven through thin boards of it, is considered best between fifty and sixty years of age. The leaves on the branches are shaped like those of Pialba, but their undersides are either coated with gray down or are quite smooth. Those of the suckers have their margins cut into angles and teeth. The female flowers mostly have four wedge-shaped purple stigmas, sometimes two which are cleft into four at their extremities. The aspen, or asp, Populus tremula, does not attain either to so large a size or so moderate an age as the abel. Its height, when full-grown, is from forty to eighty feet, and after fifty or sixty years its heartwood begins to decay, and its destruction is then hastened by the attacks of such internal feeding insects as the caterpillars of the goat-moth and the wood leopard-moth. 
the leaves on the branches are broadly egg-shaped approaching to round the waved margin cut into teeth with turned in points in one form variation viosa the leaves are covered beneath with silky or cottony hairs in the other form variation glabra they are almost smooth the leaves on the suckers are heart-shaped without teeth the leaf stalks of the aspen are longer than those of its congeners so that they are constantly on the flutter a circumstance that has led to an explanatory legend to the effect that the cross of calvary was made of aspen wood and that the tree shivers perpetually in remembrance possibly the present inferiority of aspen timber is to be explained in a similar manner the catkins which are two or three inches long are similar to those of the foregoing species but the scales have jagged edges it is indigenous in all the british isles as far north as orkney but though commonly found in copses on a moist light soil is more frequent as a planted tree in gardens and pleasure grounds it is a characteristic tree of the plains throughout the continent but ascends to sixteen hundred feet in yorkshire and in the bavarian alps is found as high as forty four hundred feet it is not a deep rooting tree the root branches running almost horizontally where accessible to cattle or deer the foliage of the suckers is easily browsed by them the black poplar populus nigra appears to be so called not by reason of any blackness of leaf or bark but because of the absence of any white or gray down on the underside of its leaves its bark is gray like that of the species already mentioned but readily distinguished from them by the great swellings and nodosities that mar the symmetry of its trunk it is a tree of erect growth fifty to sixty feet in height with horizontal branches and leaves that vary in shape from triangular and rhombic to almost circular and in width from an inch to four inches they have rounded teeth on the margins which are at first also fringed and in their young state the underside is silky the flowers in the catkins of this and the next species are not so densely packed those of the male are two or three inches in length and dark red in color their abundance before the tree has put out its leaves makes the male tree a conspicuous object the female catkins are shorter and do not droop when the roundest capsules burst in may or june to distribute their seeds the white cotton with which the latter are invested gives prominence to the female tree the wood is chiefly used by the turner in holland where it is extensively cultivated it provides the materials for sabots the black poplar is not a native of this country but it is generally distributed throughout europe and northern asia the date of its introduction is not known but it has been here for many centuries and is quite naturalized springing up on river banks and in other moist situations some botanists regard it as only a variety of the lombardy poplar but apart from the very different habit of the tree not by itself sufficient grounds for separation there is the more important fact that the black poplar rarely produces suckers from its roots whilst the lombardy poplar does so constantly however this is a point we can leave for the botanists to discuss for the purposes of this book the two trees are sufficiently distinct to be treated separately the lombardy poplar populus fastigiata is no more a native of italy than of england its home is in the taurus and the himalayas whence it has spread into persia introduced into southern europe it has become specially abundant along the rivers of lombardy and so in france and england it bears the name of that country lord rochford introduced it to england from turin in 1758 its leaves are like those of the black poplar but its branches instead of spreading all go straight upwards so that the fastigiate or spire shape of the tree is produced a shape only found otherwise among coniferous trees particularly in the cypress the juniper and the irish yew it is its form great height 100 to 150 feet and rapidity of growth that have led to its wide use here as an ornamental tree in many cases as a mere vegetable hoarding to shut out some offensive view its growth is extremely rapid especially during its first score of years when it will attain a height of sixty feet or more provided it be grown in good moist but not marshy soil its wood is of course of little value and is chiefly used for making boxes and packing cases 
where its lightness combined with toughness and cheapness is an advantage the bark is rough and deeply furrowed unlike the other species and the trunk is twisted like the black poplar it has smooth shoots and the unopened buds are sticky it is propagated in this country by suckers and cuttings it is said that the first trees introduced were so obtained and that they were all from male trees consequently that we have no female trees here and seed production is impossible if the female grows here it is certainly very scarce the bark has been used for tanning the black italian poplar populus monilifera is another misnamed tree for it is a native of north america though introduced to england from the continent in 1772 by dr john hope it has the distinction of being considered the most rapid growing even of the poplars loudon gives its rate of growth in the neighborhood of london as between thirty and forty feet in seven years even in scotland where it has been largely planted as a substitute for larch since the partial failure of that tree it attains a height of one hundred twenty feet in sixty years when planted along the river banks it is probably only a variety of p nigra which it resembles in most parts but is larger and of very erect growth the tacmahawk or balsam poplar populus balsamifera is another importation from north america introduced in 1692 in its native country it grows to a height of 80 feet but here 40 or 50 feet is more usual its leaves are of more slender form than those of the other poplars egg-shaped with a near approach to being lance-shaped their edges are toothed their upper surface dark green and smooth the underside whitish with cotton the distinctive character of the tree is the fragrance of its foliage which scents the air on moist evenings and makes the tacamahawk a desirable tree to plant near the water where alone it attains any moderate size End of section 3